You're watching San Francisco Rising with Chris Manners. Today's special guest is Ann Stuhldreyer. Hi, I'm Chris Manners, and you're watching San Francisco Rising, the show that's focused on restarting, rebuilding, and reimagining our city. Our guest today is Ann Stuhldreyer, the Director of Financial Justice in San Francisco's Office of the Treasurer, and she's with us to talk about how the city is taking the national lead in this effort and how the program is accomplishing its goals. Ms. Stuhldreyer, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris, and thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you for being here. Can we start by talking about the Financial Justice Project in a very broad sense? When did the initiative start, and what is its overall intent? Sure. The Financial Justice Project launched in 2016, and ever since then, our job has remained consistent. We take a hard look at fines, fees, tickets, financial penalties that are hitting people with low incomes, and especially people of color, really hard. It's our job to assess and reform these fines and fees. Do you have any examples of the kind of disastrous effects these escalating fines and fees can have on people who are already financially stressed? Yes, unfortunately I do. The Financial Justice Project was started in response to community outcry about the heavy toll of fines and fees. It's no surprise that when people who are struggling face an unexpected steep penalty that's beyond their ability to pay it, they face a bigger punishment than what was originally intended a spiral of consequences can set in. What started as a small problem grows bigger. For example, our traffic tickets in California are typically hundreds of dollars and are the most expensive in the nation. A few years back, we heard how tens of thousands of San Franciscans had had their driver's licenses suspended, not for dangerous driving, but because they couldn't afford to pay their traffic tickets or missed a traffic court date. Well, if someone loses their license, they typically have a hard time keeping their job and often lose it. That's confirmed by the research. We actually make it much harder for people to pay or meet their financial obligations. It's way too extreme of a penalty for the crime of not being able to pay. We were also hearing about thousands of people who were getting their cars towed. They couldn't pay the $500 to get them back and were losing their cars. Also, at the time we were handing people a bill when they got out of jail to pay for thousands of dollars in fees. We were charging people up to $35 a day to rent their electronic ankle monitor. We were charging people $1,800 up front to pay for three years of monthly $50 probation fees. People who are getting out of jail can't pay these. They need every penny they have to get back on their feet. We weren't collecting much on them either. It wasn't clear what we were accomplishing, other than heaping a world of pain on people. We were also charging mothers and grandmothers across the city hundreds of dollars in phone call fees to accept calls from their incarcerated loved ones in the San Francisco jail. We heard from mainly black and brown women who are struggling to make terrible choices. Do I pay my rent or do I accept this call from my incarcerated son? The list goes on and on. So much of this looked like a lose-lose for government and for people. These penalties were high pain, hitting people really hard, and low gain. We weren't bringing in much revenue from them. We knew there had to be a better way. It's really important that we don't excessively punish people financially, but are there other central issues we need to address? Sure. There are three core principles that drive our work. First, we believe that we should be able to hold people accountable without putting them in financial distress. Second, we believe that you should not pay a bigger penalty just because your wallet is thinner. A $300 fine hits a doctor and a daycare worker very differently. The former barely feels it. The latter can get sent into a tailspin. They can't make ends meet, their credit score takes a hit, they lose their driver's license, we dig them into a hole they can't get out of. These penalties need to be right-sized, proportioned to people's incomes. And third, we should not be balancing our budget on the backs of the poorest people in our city. So now, the Financial Justice Project was launched in 2016. Can you talk about some of the program's accomplishments since then? Sure. 
Sometimes the solution is to base a fine on someone's ability to pay, so the consequence is proportional to the offense and the person. Other times, if a fee's main job is to recoup costs and it's assessed primarily on low-income people who cannot pay, we recommend elimination. Other times, we may recommend a different pathway to accountability that does not require a money payment. Here's a few examples. Our SFMTA has implemented many sliding scale discounts for low-income people who get towed, booted, or have parking tickets they cannot afford. You still pay a penalty, but it's right-sized to their income. People with low incomes pay a lot less. We also became the first city in the nation to stop suspending people's licenses when they could not pay their traffic tickets. Instead, we focused on ways to make it easier for people to pay through payment plans, sliding scale discounts, and eliminating add-on fees that jack up the prices of tickets. This reform has become the law of the land in California and has spread to 23 other states. We also stopped handing people a bill when they get out of jail and eliminated all of our local fees charged to people in the criminal justice system. These folks have already been punished in lots of ways. They've gone to jail or are under supervision, and the collection rate on many of these fees was so low, we really weren't bringing in much revenue. The collection rate on the monthly probation fee, for example, was just 9%. This reform has become law in California and is also spreading to other states. We also made all calls from jail free. The research shows that the more incarcerated people stay in touch with their families, the better they do when they get out. But high phone call fees were making it harder for them to do so. The practice was a penny wise and a pound foolish. Now that phone calls are free, incarcerated people are now spending 80% more time in touch with their families. That means they're going to do better when they get out. We've even eliminated fines for overdue library books which our research showed were locking low-income people and people of color out of libraries. There are better ways to get people to return their books, like emailing them reminders or automatically renewing their book if there's no one in line for it. This reform has also spread to dozens of other cities which have now eliminated overdue library fines that do way more harm than good. Reforms like these that hold people accountable but don't put them in financial distress can work better for government. Studies show that local government can sometimes spend more to collect these fees than, when, than they bring in, and that when you proportion a fine to someone's income, they pay more readily. Disproportionate impact can go down and revenues can go up. Finally, I know there was an initial group of 10 cities and counties who joined the project, and that you recently had a boot camp to introduce the program to a large audience. Is this movement starting to gain traction across the country? Yes, it is. Ten cities and counties were selected from a competitive application process to launch cities and counties for fine and fee justice, and they've all adopted various reforms like we did in San Francisco. And as you mentioned, we just hosted a fine and fee justice boot camp in Phoenix, Arizona. Teams of judges, mayors, and others came from about 50 cities to learn about how they could implement reforms like the ones we have in San Francisco. There's a growing realization that these penalties are blunt instruments with all kinds of unintended consequences. It's the job of every public servant to try to find a better way. Government should be an equalizer of opportunity, not another driver of inequality. Quite right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on the show, Ms. Stooldryer. Thank you for the time you've given us today. Thank you, Chris. And that's it for this episode. We'll be back with another one shortly. You've been watching San Francisco Rising. For SFGov TV, I'm Chris Manners. Thanks for watching.